Thank you for coming today. My name is Fatma Salman, and I am the Assistant Director of the Atlantic Council South Asia Center. You are joining the Center for what promises to be a riveting and timely conversation about Afghanistan's fourth presidential elections. Today, our guests hope to cover the biggest challenges leading up to the elections, the election process, and the geopolitical implications of the preliminary results scheduled to be announced later this week. The Atlantic Council South Asia Center, in partnership with the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, is honored to host the Af Afghanistan Ambassador to the United States, Her Excellency Roya Rahmani, and NPR's National Security Correspondent, Greg Meyer. Ambassador Rahmani is the first female ambassador of Afghanistan to the United States. She assumed this position on December 14, 2018. Prior to this, she served as Afghanistan's first female ambassador to Indonesia and the country's first accredited ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. During her tenure in Indonesia, she was also accredited as Afghanistan's non-resident ambassador to Singapore. During her posting in Indonesia, the Afghan and Indonesian bilateral relationship soared to its highest since its inception in 1954. Ambassador Rahmani joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Afghanistan as a senior advisor to the Deputy Foreign Minister in 2011. From 2012 to 2016, Ambassador Rahmani served as the first Director General for Regional Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, during which she was responsible for leading her team to manage and promote the country's role and position in dozens of regional organizations and fora. Ambassador Rahmani holds a master's degree in public administration from Columbia University and a bachelor of software engineering from McGill University. She has won several awards and fellowships and is a Fulbright scholar. Ambassador Rahmani has served as a member of the board of directors of many organizations, is a Musawa advocate, and a member of the Munich Security Conference of Young Leaders. Ambassador Rahmani is joined by NPR's national security correspondent, Greg Meyer. Mr. Meyer tra first traveled to Afghanistan in 1993 when he went to negotiate the release of a journalist colleague being held captive by an Afghan warlord. He returned the following year with his journalist's wife, Jennifer Griffin, on a working honeymoon. Greg has not been allowed to plan any family trips since then. But he was one of the first reporters to interview members of an obscure new group which called itself the Taliban and he's been following Afghanistan ever since. After two decades as a foreign correspondent with the Associated Press and the New York Times, he's now based here in Washington, D.C. as an NPR national security correspondent. So without further ado, I would like to invite Ambassador Rahmani up to the podium for opening remarks. Thank you. Hello, ambassadors, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, and assalamu alaikum, may peace be upon you. It's a great pleasure to be here today to speak about Afghanistan's fourth presidential election. You will understand why I'm making specifically this statement. As an Afghan, I'm very proud of what we have accomplished in these elections. For the first time in a very long time, I see the path to peace and prosperity clearly visible before me. Though we still have a long road to travel, today we have much to celebrate. On September 28, around 3 million P Afghans, in brave defiance of terrorist threats, went to the polls and casted their votes. After voting, many of them posted pictures on social media proudly showing inked fingers next to the ones once imputed by the Taliban when they dared to vote in previous elections. You can't stop us, their captions read. The people of Afghanistan have made many strides in the last 18 years, and this embrace of democracy that we have witnessed in the past few years is by far the most significant. And these latest presidential elections, the first secured entirely by Afghan forces with lower number of casualties in comparison to those held previously, 
represented a critical step in our evolution as a new democracy and on our path towards self-reliance. They were also, I would add, an important milestone in our counterterrorism strategy, which we share with the United States and our international partners. Let me explain. Though perhaps not the most obvious and visible tool we have in our fight against terrorism, the past decade of conflict have shown us that growing our democracy is the key to dismantling the enabling environment that once made the country so appealing to extremists and so dangerous to the rest of the world. By elevating previously unheard voices and taking on the reform necessary to bring opportunity and hope to the Afghan people, we are putting in place the only real insurance policy against the spread of radical ideologies. In this context, around 3 million Afghans who came out to the 26,568 polling stations set up around the country or the or at the forefront of a nationwide effort to bring peace and prosperity, not only to Afghans, but to the entire region. When they cast their ballot, they were not only voting to select our next president, but also to cement our commitment to democracy. and to the continuity of the constitutional order as the only pathway forward towards sustainable peace. Today, as we seek to assess what worked or didn't work during this election cycle, I think it's important to remember this important context. We must remind ourselves of how far we have come and keep in mind that the democracy, democratic processes take practice and it's particularly challenging where there is an ongoing conflict. The presidential election that took place on September 28 was our fourth presidential election since 2001. And as I mentioned earlier, it was the first fully secured Afghan secure, uh, uh, the first fully the, uh, secured by the Afghan security forces. 70,000 security personnel were dispatched all over the country to ensure the safety of our citizens who came out to vote. I have been so pleased by reports that despite an increased level of threats from the Taliban, there were less security incidences this time around during, uh, in comparison to the previous cycles. This is an achievement that cannot be understated. Reports of fraud and corruption were also minimal. Although we did not have international observers, 69,000 Afghan observers were accredited to monitor the election process. In addition, biometric technology was introduced after an election assessment was conducted by both national and international authorities. In total, 25,000 biometric devices were purchased and placed uh, at all polling stations, improving transparency and limiting the opportunity for fraud. At this point, we have heard from election observers that they have been satisfied with the legitimacy of the process. Importantly, I will also note that this legitimacy have been safeguarded by two independent commissions which have overseen the process and, ha and handled complaints. A consultative process involving representatives of the parliament, presidential candidates, political parties, and civil society was held prior to the election to amend the election electoral laws and to ensure that the commission members were elected in a fair and impartial way. And for the first time, both election commissions are now headed by two women. As we wait for votes, to be tallied, one of the biggest complaints we have heard has been about the slow process. The delays have been due to the internet issues uh, and to the fact that in information from the biometric devices is taking longer to be transferred than expected. Experts are working on the issue to solve it. In the meantime, it, it has felt so good 
to see how much people are paying attention to the process. I know it will take time, many years and many election cycles for us to perfect our processes. No democracy, even the most well-established, is perfect. But I also know that this level of deep engagement is the necessary first step. This is how democracies are built. Given all of this, I'm sure you can imagine how disappointed our international, uh, how this, uh, you can imagine my disappointment over the international coverage that has focused on little beyond the low turnout. In many ways, this is understandable. The state of the world today is such that many passing issues drawing our attention in competing directions. But for those of us who care about Afghanistan and the fight against terrorism, it's important that we not lose sight of the momentous shift that this election presents. Afghanistan risked, Afghanistan risks its citizens' lives uh, who went to the polls to vote on December 28th because they have come to believe that their votes and voices matter. Despite serious, trips, despite serious threats, long lines, and other hardship, millions of Afghans took the time to register and to go out and vote. They carefully followed the procedures and headed, and headed on their assigned polling stations where they had their photographs and fingerprints taken when they cast the ballots. More than anything, Afghans want to end the conflict and, uh, by a political settlement. We are tired of violence. Today, more than ever, our citizens know that the military cannot provide a full solution to the challenges that we face. They know that the peace building will require participation and buy-in from all Afghans, and so they are committed to doing so uh, and uh, playing their part towards finding a solution. These Mandun electoral tasks, activities that so many around the world take for granted, represent for millions of Afghan citizens the potential to finally play a role in creating the nation and the lives that they want. They represent their hope for a better future. On this, I would like to make one more important point. Whether in counterterrorism, in peacemaking, or the implementation of a peace deal, experience has shown us that the United States needs a strong partner in Afghanistan. An elected central government with a legitimate mandate from the people can be that strong partner and can ensure that our security forces remain intact. Working effectively with our American counterparts, with these elections, we have taken an important step in safeguarding the effectiveness of our partnership. Right now, the people who are rise, rising to leadership positions in Afghanistan, our ministers, bureaucrats, and po politicians who are helping to develop our nascent democracy are the very people that you have invested so much in training. They share your values and once elected, will be ready to work together to achieve our common goals. As we reflect, on these past elections, we must not lose sight of this. Perfecting this process is a key component of what the battle for self-determination and fight against terrorism look like for Afghanistan in 2019. On September 28th, we experienced a genuine victory. I thank you.
Thank you, Ambassador, for uh, giving us that, uh, that overview and, and bringing us up to date. Um, thank all of you for, for coming as well. Uh, really a uh, pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, we're going to dive right into the election. But, and I know we have many people who are very expert on Afghanistan in this room. But before we get started, I, I just want to, to ask a quick personal question. Um, uh, from, from your own winding story that's brought you here today. Um, you were born in Kabul in 1978, uh, the year before the Soviet invasion. Your country has been at war your entire life. Um, you left to Pakistan as a, as a teenager. Uh, you went to McGill University in Canada. You went to Columbia University in New York. Um, you've had this long winding journey. At what, in, in an odd way, it seems like uh, this may have prepared you well. At what point did you think you might be Afghanistan's top diplomat in the United States? Uh, thank you, Greg. Good to see you again. And I want to thank once again to all who are present uh, here. Uh, to your question, at no point. Uh, <laughs> because uh, when you live in a situation of conflict, it, the one thing that it trains you is that you cannot really plan. You do not have the luxury of uh, really being able to chart your life. You have to uh, be able to continuously adjust and readjust yourself uh, to the realities that, is, uh, that uh, life will bring to you. So what I was trained uh, for is that uh, being able to adjust myself. So I think that uh, somewhat helped uh, to bringing me where I am. That's great preparation for being in Washington today, I think. So um, you should feel right at home. Um, so br bring us up to date um, as you were. Are we still expecting around the 19th, three days from now, just to, to hear some preliminary results? There have been reports of delays in the election counting. Um, is, what should we be looking for in the, in the next few days? Uh, is this working? Yeah? Okay. Uh, based on the information that the commission uh, has been given, uh, is that uh, we are still hoping that next week we should uh, receive uh, the preliminary count of the votes uh, of the presidential election. Uh, although uh, there is uh, some uh, few days of delays expected, some members of the commission have been saying that there could be three days to a maximum of a week delay in counting, and that is due to the, some of the matters that I mentioned before in my remarks, uh, which is the, because initially they, uh, what they did uh, was they were trying to transfer the data through the biometric, uh, from the biometric systems via internet to the servers, and that took a very long time, and um, to address that issue, the experts, uh, uh, were invited to look into it and one of the solutions proposed was that they should take out the chips from the biometric devices and put them into the computer so that, that the upload would take uh, minutes instead of hours. Uh, and this is what they are practicing now and with that uh, uh, change we are hoping that uh, soon the, uh, the, the votes will be tallied. Okay, so maybe next week is when we should just see something like that. And, and the date that we're, we've heard of previously is November if we don't have mm -hmm. a clear winner, um, if somebody, one of the candidates getting 50% or more, um, November 23rd would be the runoff. Is that still the target date for a runoff election if it's needed? Uh, these are, uh, I will tell you that, that as a uh, government official, I am also following the same news as all of you from the Election Commission because one of our efforts has been that uh, the commissions are completely independent, we are listening to them, whatever they are telling us, that's what we are uh, also uh, abiding by and this is completely uh, what we are also hearing that uh, once the votes are tallied, that was the date that, that they had uh, decided on uh, should there be a runoff uh, now if if there is a delay of three uh, days to uh, five to six days then may I am assuming that that day might also be adjusted but again we are here we are waiting to hear that from the commissions mm -hmm. now it's hard to overstate how much effort has to go into an election in Afghanistan the security operation throughout the entire country which the, the preparation was in months. And it's not just a question of getting polling stations ready, it's, it's this, the new biometric data 
um, and, and for maybe just you could explain a little bit about that. But but just talk about these months of preparation and mm -hmm. what it means, and, and does it in some sense bring the country to a little bit of a standstill as you make all of the, or the government perhaps to, to as all of these preparations were made both on the security front the the technology front using this biometric data and, and if you could talk a little bit how that worked uh, what I would uh, really like to share is that based on my last visit to Afghanistan which was in the Fox beginning of September uh, what and as the preparations were in full swing at the time for the upcoming election what I witnessed uh, were on two checks. One, that uh, how much all, all our institu uh, relevant institutions took on themselves and how seriously they tried to ensure that all the preparations are uh, in place. The Ministry of Interior was uh, responsible for the uh, security as well as the, a lot of the logistical matters related to the security because given that uh, it was an election that uh, on which the, an, a war was announced. Like it was not just a, uh, of course we uh, have a ongoing conflict and there is violence, but uh, the Taliban uh, ma made specific threats uh, on the election and people, and uh, warned people not to participate. And this, uh, their threats uh, were everywhere. I knew people in Kabul. I, I knew schools uh, who received, uh, received the, the threats from the Taliban regarding their participation in the election. So in such a context, uh, I cannot say uh, or emphasize mo uh, enough that how proud of uh, our security forces we are. The 70,000 of them that, that were dispatched around uh, with, with, uh, went into the election with complete uh, preparedness and there was about 20 to 30,000 also in standby uh, should there be any incidences. Uh, of course, it, it took them uh, months of preparation. Uh, one of the other things that I, I was extremely pleased to witness uh, during my visit in Afghanistan was the level of coordination because uh, in Afghanistan, and especially over the past 18 years where more than 40 countries have been involved in reconstruction of Afghanistan, one thing was proven that nothing is more important than coordination. And in such uh, situations, uh, that that uh, we were faced with huge threats from the Taliban uh, for the security, the coordination level among the security forces was absolutely impressive. Uh, the, in terms of the recruitment uh, of the people who were supposed to be working on election, 200,000 people were recruited uh, over the past months who worked on election. 10,000 women were recruited uh, uh, along 10,000 male escorts where they needed in order to allow them to go to the least, uh, less secure areas and uh, serve as searchers during the election day. So all of this uh, happened uh, in a very smooth way, I must say, uh, because of the dedication of our people, uh, because of their resolve towards democracy, because they wanted this election to take place. Now, uh, the other track I wanted to uh, talk about is uh, you uh, mentioned that whether uh, it was uh, taking a toll in terms of what else we needed to do to run the country as a government or not. Uh, I uh, can also share that uh, one of the pleasures that, that uh, I have uh, doing my job is that whenever I am sitting here in Washington or I am going to Kabul, I see uh, delegations coming at whatever level they come, and they work as if there is no election, there is no political issue, there is no conflict, and that's such a uh, source of hope and inspiration. This is where, it, th this is the biggest testament that how much our country has evolved and how much uh, we have gained and changed. Because whenever they, whenever I meet people. Uh, regardless of their sectors, they work as if their jobs are secured for the rest of their lives. They work as if there is no change, no election, no violence, no conflict, nothing. They are very much focused and they want to work uh, and achieve their goals. So this this was another thing that I witnessed first, firsthand during my last trip. Mm -hmm. And I think from this distance, a lot of us were not able to see all the preparations and all the effort uh, that, that went into to pulling this election off. 
um, and, and Afghanistan certainly uh, deserves uh, tremendous credit for that. On the other hand, um, it seemed that uh, there, there was violence uh, leading up to the election on election day, uh, perhaps less than, than many had uh, feared. Uh, but the turnout was also lower than in, in past elections. So it seems like there were, there were some sort of points on, on both sides. Um, uh, how do you walk away from that in, in terms of the turnout, to the, the level of violence, the tone of the campaign compared to previous elections? Uh, the low turnout, which as I mentioned was one of the focus of some of the reports that came out from Afghanistan, uh, in my view was not low for a variety of reasons. Number one, this election again happened when people went to the polls knowing that they are direct target of the Taliban. It was the worst uh, if you compare it to any of our previous elections. O although we had fewer incidences and fewer casualties in comparison to the previous elections. And that was again thanks to our security forces. That was one uh, aspect, the threat of the Taliban specifically geared to the, uh, towards the election. Number two, the campaign uh, season started later than, uh, than the usual. And that was because of a lot of the uncertainties that were casted during the talks and uh, people were wondering what's going on, whether how the election is going to take place, with, whether is it going to take place or not, whether it, would it be on time or not. So that, that had also an impact in terms of the, the turnout of the uh, people. Uh, number three, uh, in my view, it's not necessarily a very low turnout because under the circumstances that people went out and voted, three million people is uh, still uh, quite impressive given the, all the hardship and the, mm, the uh, threats and everything that existed. But also, if you compare it to the previous election, when we say, when we give the number, it's the number that each vote is for sure belonging to a, an individual. It, of course, we cannot trace who casted the vote, but we can at least be ensured that based on the pictures, the fingerprints, the uh, the, uh, all the measures uh, that were put in place in all those polling stations, that the levels of fraud was absolutely minimized. There's so many layers of verification that was put in place in this election was unprecedented. Uh, I don't even know to that level in m if, if it is happening in uh, the other countries Here. comparably. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> But uh, there was a very uh, uh, strong and uh, genuine efforts uh, in terms of the verification. It was the first time that, uh, of course, we introduced it in the parliamentary, uh, parliamentary election last October, but then this time all the voters had to go to a very specific uh, polling station. Uh, we had a uh, voters list the, that people had to register. Uh, the, all the processes that were introduced for the verification, including voters list, the biometric devices, the, the procedures that people had to go from the time that they would register themselves as a uh, voter until they cast their ballot, uh, was also uh, cumbersome, I must say. Uh, of course, it was, it was an attempt for the uh, transparency, but uh, that could be also uh, sometimes discouraging for people mm -hmm. to go through such lengthy processes to cast your uh, ballots. But uh, the outcome is that whatever is coming out of these elections is uh, something that we are extremely proud of. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the last election in 2014, we ended up with a very close ballot and uh, then it, months of sort of negotiations ensued. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, um, uh, tried to, was involved in brokering an, an agreement. Um, do you think that, th that there's any alternative that you'll, you'll have to have a government that includes a number of, how we don't know the results, whether we may still be looking at a runoff, um, but I guess, number one, are you concerned that there could be another lengthy process that takes months and months and can be divisive 
um, that plays out? Or do you think that it, no matter what happens, there is going to have to be some compromise and the government's going to have to include a wide range of players to make many people feel represented? Um, I hope that, that it is uh, not going to be as cumbersome as it was uh, last time. Um, and it's more than a hope, I must say, because uh, one of the reasons that last time uh, we had that issue was the b because uh, the contestants uh, made a point about the level of frauds and the lack of transparency, the number of voters and whatnot, which uh, as a measure uh, to mitigate those, we introduced these lengthy processes for verification because we wanted to ensure that the transparency is 100% there, or at least to the extent that as uh, uh, possible or even more than expected. So that's one reason that, that I'm hoping that, uh, or uh, uh, I'm expecting, uh, I must say, that it would not, uh, we would not see anything similar to the, to the previous uh, election. And the other aspect of it is that, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, democracies are practice. I mean, like uh, we, uh, it, and, and these are not easy. It, it has its own limitations. It's not that everybody is going to be 100% happy. If, it is, if, if you know of any democracy, that this is true, please let me know. I, 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 I would like to take the examples back home. Um, but uh, this is uh, an issue, and uh, there would be contestation. There would be uh, people who wouldn't be happy. But I have no doubt that we would come in terms with it. I want to give a brief example of our last parliamentary election. Our last parliamentary election uh, faced some issues because we did introduce new measures. We uh, put in place additional steps for verification. Uh, and as a result, it, there were some contestation. It took longer to tally all the votes. Uh, it took longer for the parliament to start uh, its function. And then it took them a long time to also um, elect the speaker of the house. But um, for us, I mean, following things closely, of course, it was frustrating. And then we uh, were blaming them. And you know, uh, there, was, there was lots uh, happening. It took almost f uh, about a month for the Speaker of the House to be elected. But it proved two things. One is that the Parliament refused to submit to any other process other than electoral processes to elect the Speaker of the House. No matter what happened, uh, what the contestation was, they insisted that they would keep on voting over and over until they would have a result that would be agreeable to all of them. And as a result of that, the Speaker uh, uh, was voted in. And the, the person who was contesting the result in, in the previous round uh, took his hand led him to his chair and congratulated him. And now we have a functioning parliament in place. So my point is that these things are part of the political uh, practice that we are going through, the, the practice of democracy. And I am, uh, of course, number one, inviting my people in my country to be patient, uh, to be responsible, and to uh, um, think of the national interest, but uh, also our partners. Uh, I am asking our partners, international allies, who have invested so much in our institutions and in our democracy, um, to also support us in this journey. And uh, let, us, let us play and learn. How would you like the United States to look at Afghanistan right now in, in the next couple months? Would you like the U.S. maybe to sort of um, let Afghanistan be and work out these issues surrounding the election and, and putting together a new government? Um, or would you welcome a very intense uh, U.S. Uh, focus on Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan becoming uh, a major issue in a U.S. election? The candidates might bring it up but, uh, briefly, but then it tends to go away. How much attention, what role would you like the U.S. to be, be playing right now? Um, we want the United States to look at us as we are, meaning their partner. We have been the United States partner in the fight against terrorism over the past 18 years. Uh, we are extremely grateful 
to all the sacrifices, immense investments that were made. But we have also reciprocated that with immense amount of sacrifices ourselves. We are your partner taking a very important fight against terrorism, violent extremism, uh, forward in the region in for, for our safety and security and for yours. And if you continue to look at us as our partner, we have our internal issues that we can solve, and then we have the shared uh, interests and fights that we can do it together. Uh, for the, um, whether Afghanistan would be an issue in the next presidential election, I think that as a country that the United States have invested so much in, um, the, uh, it's characterized as the longest war. Uh, we could also talk uh, about it as the longest partnership or a success story of an intervention because we have sufficient reasons and data to back that claim. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's an important part of your foreign policy. It's a very important element. It's important to be engaged, but uh, the engagement uh, should be uh, basically based on uh, attention and details and realities. We have a rapidly changing environment back in Afghanistan, which you have helped us. Uh, to get there and then uh, also a very complex situation in terms of our the conflict uh, happening in terms of our geography and geopolitical dynamics happening so um, uh, to put it very simply uh, making passing uh, statements uh, without looking into the all the levels and the depth of the issue uh, is not helpful to anybody. So it's better not to be engaged uh, to, than to be shallow about it. Mm -hmm. and, and do you feel that Afghanistan is at a, a vulnerable moment in any way as it's trying to, to uh, work its way through this election and create a new government? Uh, a month ago, the, the president, President Trump made a very dramatic announcement about what uh, saying he was on the verge of an agreement with the Taliban. We've seen uh, a rather uh, precipitous uh, development in northern Syria, his talk about removing troops, about taking action. You know, are you concerned at this moment that things could happen quite quickly or dramatically? Announcements could happen, changes could be made um, that, that aren't expected and, and throw, throw everybody off course? Uh, I am uh, concerned uh, not necessarily about the decisions or how uh, the decisions to be made. It's how these decisions to be made. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, we have been uh, cherishing this partnership. Right now it's not the American troops who are fighting against terrorism and extremism in Afghanistan. There is 14,000 of them but it's the Afghan forces who are carrying and taking this forward. Should we have the level of the coordination and partnership that is necessary? I am not concerned that we can get to whatever is viable for both of our countries. And we are happy to work together and to make necessary adjustments. But uh, whether Afghanistan is in a critical moment, yes, we are because uh, this election is not simply a choice about who would be the leader of the country, who would be the head of the state. It's a lot more than that. It's the pathway to our, towards our future. It's, it's about voting for a republic system. It's about choosing democracy over uh, the other uh, possibilities. And it is about moving forward and not backward. So that uh, is, uh, that's why we are at a very critical juncture and we need, uh, we demonstrated our resolve to democracy, to a system of republic, and we hope uh, that our partners could also trust in it as much as we do. Mm -hmm. Um, Ambassador, I'd like to, to throw this open uh, to questions, so uh, please uh, jump right in. And it looks like we've got hands uh, going up already. So uh, the gentleman right here, uh, I've got a microphone coming right behind you. 
My name is Saeed Mirzad. I am the oldest uh, American, Afghan American living. <laughs> you know what is what is important? You know in this what I felt that was important in this uh, uh, voting system is that the Taliban didn't have enough people to send in all these centers to make trouble. It means that the Taliban that are known as a power, they are not. They are not 50,000 people. They are not 40,000 people. You have, you know, 15, 20, 30 people making trouble here and there. That should show to the world that the Taliban are not a power. The other thing, the question that I had to Madam Ambassador was that they mentioned, you know, something like three million people voting, but they said that that was including the, uh, uh, the, the normal system and the one without the normal system, bi biometric. Now, do you have any idea of how many non-biometric system, uh, I mean, vote had been uh, voted out, or, or you don't know it, like me? Yeah. Salam, Ustad. Good to see you. <laughs> um, s about the uh, number of uh, votes that uh, were entered by biometric systems and otherwise, uh, just the recent announcement by the election commission uh, demonstrated, uh, well, they, they made an announcement that 1,700,000 uh, th uh, votes from biometric systems have entered the computers, but it's not complete. They said between 75 to 85 percent of the devices were tallied, and that amounted to 1.7 million. So that gives us an indication that more than 2 million votes, uh, at least, are already uh, through biometric systems. About the manual voting, um, there were places that the systems uh, had difficulties or maybe didn't work as properly. And also, it was because of unfamiliarity of the uh, people who were working in these polling stations in the use of bi biometric systems that uh, as a result of that they could not use the biometric device and they had to resort to using the manual sheets for the voting. That has been the, the reason why there was uh, manual voting also registered. Uh, so uh, how they are going to count uh, is completely a decision of the commissions. Um, they, uh, of course, there have been people who are uh, sharing their concerns that they went out and voted and their voices should be heard. If it's not biometric, uh, it still be, should be counted. And then there is also people who are advocating that only biometric uh, votes should be counted. And also, not, uh, let's not forget that uh, we have an election, com uh, an election complaint, complaint commission and their responsibility and job is to also uh, discount the votes that, that has any sort of problem or it presents any kind of deficiencies uh, as, a legitimate, uh, as legitimate votes. So they are also working and they will be also uh, subtracting the, the number of votes uh, that way. Okay. I believe we had a question over here, this gentleman. Uh, Madam Ambassador, Mark Classic from Georgetown, uh, thank you very much for your comments. And as a fellow Fulbrighter, I could think you're a living representation of why we have the Fulbright program. Uh, as someone who spent time in Afghanistan in 06, 07, I can see the tr immense tra trajectory the country's taken. Uh, it's easy to read bad news about Afghanistan and the domestic press here. Can you give us a story of when we walk home tonight and think about the positive change this country has seen beyond just the election? Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to? comment on well, that? Well, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, because election was very important uh, milestone for us, and we have uh, our reasons, uh, particularly for women, I must say, because uh, when I went last time to Afghanistan, 
uh, one of the things that struck me that how organized women groups have been and how much they demonstrated their devotion to democracy. And there was a reason for it, because they knew that, that the, at the very moment that we stand, uh, supporting democratic systems, uh, sustaining our institution is the only way forward. And should this be at risk, they are the ones that will be losing the most. So they were very uh, much uh, concerned about uh, that, and they were uh, demonstrating their devotion. But your point about so many progress that we don't hear as often as we would like uh, about uh, is present, is absolutely very valid. and. Uh, as a fellow uh, Fulbrighter and uh, also young leaders and many other ways that I know Professor Vlasic, uh, I think you can help us in that advocacy. Any examples um, of things you saw in, in any of your recent visits that, that you wouldn't hear about in the news? Um, just things that women are doing or young people are doing that you, you know, or you struck you as new in any of your, your recent uh, visits there? Well, a few, the, a few anecdotes that I could share is that uh, every time, of course, when I travel to Afghanistan, uh, uh, violence and insecurity is a real thing. When you get there and you uh, uh, know that, that every moment an incident could happen is something very real, I will share something with you uh, that um, in one of the days as I was uh, going to a meeting, uh, my driver uh, was not present in the car and uh, he just keep running and apologizing for not being there and he said that, that uh, he was, uh, he went for an ablution. An ablution is the practice that, that uh, people do uh, before a prayer. And it was not a prayer time. And, uh, he he told me that, that uh, he wanted to be ready in case we get caught in an ox accident and we die. So like the, the driver was basically preparing as we were leaving for a meeting that it could be uh, the last chance for him to prepare and be ready in case uh, we, we get blown up. Um, so that's, that's, that's the context that's, that's uh, very present. And yet in this context, I, I saw so much happening and like a full uh, uh, people with full energy and enthusiasm working long hours, those who are working during the day and registering themselves for uh, at, the, at the private and public institutions to continue their education in the evening. Um, the, the, mother that I learned about that uh, uh, had lost two, ho two of her sons uh, in this fight uh, against terrorism. And uh, she said that uh, uh, she was ready to send the rest of her sons uh, still to continue the fight. Uh, I um, uh, met a family uh, that uh, the mother, the father, and the two sons were all part of the security forces. Uh, and yet uh, they were struggling and they were trying to save some money to uh, reconstruct their house or part of the house that, uh, as an extension. Um, I um, uh, learned about the driving schools opening in the least secure provinces. I don't know if you know that in Helmand province for the first time, uh, women had uh, the opportunity to learn driving and they had 11 graduates uh, from the school. Uh, I learned about uh, the six Kandahari women in the Kandahar province um, who, who are six sisters and they have chosen to um, uh, basically raise their voices through arts and painting. Uh, and that, that really uh, captured me because I remember that I, I saw a video about them and what they were doing and all that. And uh, I just remembered that in 2005 and six, when I visited Kandahar, 
uh, I was going to support some women's centers and uh, review their work. Uh, and because I was not wearing a burqa, everybody used to call me a doctor. I'm a medical doctor, they meant. And uh, that, that was because at the time, it was only uh, women doctors that they would not wear a burqa. But then um, today, these girls are going to the centers to pursue arts. And they find it as a way to, uh, to basically raise their voice and concern and whatnot. But more than that, what was impressive is that their families support them. That's where a shift in the mindset has happened. Uh, I want to stop by saying, the, um, as I mentioned, sh a shift in the mindset that in my parents' generation, and even if I, if I um, came to world that now everybody knows it was 1978, and if it was not 1978, <laughs> it was just a few years earlier. Um, uh, then uh, I uh, would have gone to university maybe in Afghanistan, and then I was uh, entitled to a small stipend. Uh, not only that I wouldn't pay for my education, but I would have been entitled to a small stipend to encourage people to, to seek tertiary education. But today, people are paying. People are working and paying for education, and all they want is the opportunity to be enrolled to have access to learn these skills. So there is where such a shift in the mindset has occurred. Uh, maybe time for one last question. Any more questions? Oh, lots of questions. Right here, gentlemen, right here. Thanks so much for the opportunity, and thanks so much for a comprehensive presentation. My name is Mansoor Mansoor, and I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, my question is back to, uh, in relation to election. Given that uh, most of the presidential candidates declared themselves as the winners, and uh, as you may know that uh, a joint government is no longer going to be acceptable for most of the Afghan people. And we know that the situation, particularly the part of election uh, uh, dispute resolution, is going to be even complex and, and complicated. Do you anticipate or uh, envision a kind of power sharing government even though if it's not going to be called a unity government. And just a follow-up question on that. How do you see like the women's participation throughout the election process as well? Just not the head of uh, two AMBs, like overall Afghans women's participation throughout the process. Thank you. Uh, whether we are envisaging a power sharing government, I think governments are about power sharing. Everybody comes together <laughs> and they vote and then they sit uh, away. But I know what you were talking about. You just said that a, um, like a uh, system that, that we experienced in 2014 is not acceptable. I think it is also uh, the same thing that we are hearing back in Afghanistan from the candidates themselves too. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, that, that everybody believes that uh, we need a strong central government uh, to continue and carry uh, on the very important task before us. Uh, I believe that, uh, that that's not something that's envisaged and people are uh, looking into. Uh, about the women's participation, uh, the, as voters uh, at certain places, the number of women was low, particularly in the uh, least secure or less secure uh, places. And uh, you are an Afghan, you would know why. Uh, it is, of course, uh, the, the restrictions are usually multiplied on women's movement and the situations of conflict, uh, particularly on the movements and stuff, and also the, the threat that they were facing uh, the, because of the warning that was given about this election. Uh, but uh, at in the overall uh, level, uh, in terms of the, their participation to be involved in the management of the election, I mean, the fact that, that the heads of the commissions are women uh, speaks volume. So, and at the same time, uh, the, there is a good number of commissioners that are women. Uh, and uh, that's, that's basically a testament. And even uh, it was a criteria when 
when the commissioners were nominated by the by the candidates and the political parties and civil society that at least a third of them must be women ambassador thank you very much i think we'll have to to leave it there so thank you uh, thank the atlantic council for hosting this event and thanks to all of you for coming today really appreciate it <laughs>